All right, welcome to As in Heaven, Season 3. My name is Jim Davis. I am your host and pastor of Orlando Grace Church. I'm joined by my co-host, Skylar Flowers, who serves as the student pastor at Grace Bible Church in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, Before going to Oxford, Skylar served as our director of youth ministries here at Orlando Grace Church, and he sits on the Rooted Steering Committee, uh, an organization we're going to talk more about in a little bit. Today, we have the privilege of being joined by my good friend, Cameron Cole. Cameron and I have known each other for some time. Uh, We met at RTS Orlando back in the day when when we were both uh, trying to cram a three and a half year degree into a somewhat larger time frame. <laughs> <laughs> Two presidencies. We, we, we made it though. We made it. Cameron yeah. has been the director of youth ministries at the Cathedral Church of the Advent since December of 2005. And in January of 2016, his duties expanded to include children, youth, and families. He is the founding chairman of Rooted Ministry, and this is an organization that promotes gospel-centered youth ministry. He is the co-editor of Gospel-Centered Youth Ministry, a practice guide, and Cameron is the author of Therefore I Have Hope, 12 Truths That Comfort, Sustain, and Redeem in Tragedy uh, through his own story of tragedy in his life. Few people Uh, have thought through how to take the gospel to our children like Cameron. He's an incredible guy. He's a great friend, one of the smartest people I know, and maybe also the biggest Alabama fan that I know. Uh, Cameron, we're really glad to have you here as we talk about this missed generational handoff. Thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. If I'm on the if I'm one of the smarter people, you know, you need to get you need to make more friends. Do you want me to ask you what you made on the SAT? <laughs> I'm, just pub, I'm just a public educated kid uh, from the state of Alabama. You forget? Well, I know what you made on the SAT. I, I know it. <laughs> Uh, very as a gift to the kingdom in many ways. Uh, as, as you know, if you've been with us this season on the podcast, we've been talking about living in a new context in the U.S. called the Great Dechurching, as between 30 and 50 million people who used to regularly attend church do not anymore, which is changing everything about the society that we live in today and will continue to in future generations if nothing changes, if we stay on the same trajectory. Studies tell us that one of the largest exit ramps out there uh, from the church occurs in this time frame when students first leave their parent and when students first leave their parents' house to go into college and career, which means that if we want to address de-churching in America as a church, we have to pay very close attention to how we're building up students for a lifelong faith before they, they leave their homes, set them up for success. So it means that we're gonna have to talk about youth ministry whatever that might look like. There's no one better, I don't believe, to have this conversation with than Cameron. So, man, thank you so much. I want to, before I dive into the first um, the first uh, question, I want to give an anecdotal story. Um, last year, I was at a uh, fundraising event, and um, there, there was a really well-known pastor who was the main keynote speaker. I, I w- my job was just a 10-minute little thing on de-churching. It was not a significant talk. And I, I, so I did my thing. This well-known pastor did his thing. And then afterwards, it was just really odd experience because I realized there's a line of people to talk to me. And this really great pastor was getting coffee by himself. And I was like, and people are, are wanting to give me business cards and understand our ministry more. And it hit me. I talked about de-churching and I'm talking about their children and their grandchildren. And there's nothing in this world <laughs> that, that, you know, that's more important to us than our children and grandchildren. My kids are 14, 12, 11, and eight. How old are your kids, Cameron? Uh, I've got at home, I have a uh, just turned 10 today. Just turned eight on Sunday, and a uh, five-year-old. We say, as we say, we breed uh, cute kids with magnificent hair. <laughs> well, I say all this to say, like, I, I don't know that there's anything more important, humanly speaking, than my children, and spiritually speaking, that they would know Jesus and have a fruitful life. Um, 
uh, with him. So here's the first question, Cameron. I just want to lead off by asking you, you've been in youth ministry for 20 years. You founded the ministry that is geared towards equipping parents and youth ministers for reaching and building up students. Uh, we did a study. Um, you know, we own what is currently the most comprehensive and detailed um, nationwide quantitative academic study on de-churching. And w- one of the things that stuck out to me and all of us at the team, uh, the period, the time period when people would say their faith was the strongest was the time in their home leading up to the teenage years. And then the time period where their faith was the most challenging or weakest was the time period right after that. So the time period of greatest faith and least faith or easiest to be a Christian, hardest to be a Christian were right next to each other in this time period. So why is it that you see the time period between sixth and 12th grade so challenging and so crucial to people's lives? That's a great question, Jim. You know, I think that, um, you know, I think on one hand, um, there's just so much developmentally going on in that time period. And so much of that is leading toward a child becoming you know, independent. And so, um, so with that being said, you know, to developmentally have a child, they're thinking about where they fit into a group. They're striving for independence. They have a ton going on uh, physically and physiologically. It's just this kind of avalanche going on developmentally. And then, you know, another thing too, I would say is that this is more true in middle class and upper middle class suburban settings, but six to 12 um, kids, kids start to spend less and less time with their parents. And, um, and, you know, in our country today too frequently, what's happening is kids get overscheduled and things like regular church attendance become less of a priority. And so, um, yeah, so, you know, you're, you're preparing a child, you know, when you, when a child hits adolescence, particularly when they hit like 10th grade, you're trying to prepare them for the real world. And, um, I have a friend who is a uh, pastor up in North Carolina and he, what he does with his kids, their senior year of high school is they don't have a curfew. They don't have any restrictions on their phone at all. They can essentially do whatever they want. And his thinking, and that, that to me seems kind of crazy. Like, well, I've got an 18-year-old, and I'm going to let them do whatever they want. His thinking is, well, they're going to be able to do whatever they want next year in college. And so I'm going to let them, I'm going to let them, you know, have total freedom under my roof for a year. I think a lot of, I think a lot of parents are thinking in such a protection, protectionistic mindset um, that they're not thinking about preparing their kids. They're just trying to insulate them from bad decisions. Um, and, uh, where you really need to be thinking about preparing them. I'd say another thing as well is that, um, you know, biblical literacy is so, so bad in our country. So it's theological literacy amongst, you know, believers. And, um, I think we do have to ask the question before sixth grade, how well, um, how well grounded are our kids in the Bible and how well catechized are our children? Um, you know, cause, uh, that that's that the kids really need a, a really firm and strong foundation when they before they get into middle school. They do start to, you know, they do start to think independently. They do start to want to think for themselves. And um, you know, they already need those foundations um before uh before you know before they enter into adolescence. And so uh, you know, while I think that six through twelve, there's a ton going on developmentally, we want to be thinking about preparing them for the real world. We want to be, you know, allowing them to ask questions and to nurture their doubts. Um, or I should say honor their doubts, maybe not nurture their doubts, honor their doubts. Um, but, uh, but, but before that, kids really need to have a, a strong knowledge, a strong biblical literacy and a strong theological literacy. Well, let me, I'm, I, I, I want to follow up real quick um, on that. You touched two points that I think are are. Well, so we saw in our study, one of the things people who left the church in this age range have said is church wasn't a place where they could be honest about their doubts. So this is going to be a two-part follow-up. So church, what does that look like? And then the second thing that we heard is when I got to high school, church really wasn't a priority. Our sports were. My parents made our sports a priority. So can you just, you touched on those two things a little bit. Can you flesh that out a little bit? Yeah, um, that's great. So so it's interesting. Paul David Tripp, on, on this first question about allowing kids to, you know, raise questions. 
Paul David Chips talks about, you know, how surprised we are by kids' sin. It's like we believe in sin, but we're stunned that our kids are going to sin. <laughs> and how inconvenient it is when our kids make mistakes and we're, you know, we just see that as just like, how, how could you do this? How could you be such an inconvenience? When in reality, don't get mad at a child for needing parenting. It's your, you know, it's your job. So, you know, on one hand, I think that, um, you know, a, a big theme, I think, of this whole conversation is just evangelical parents in particular living in fear, operating out of fear. And so you hear a child ask a question, express a doubt, and the slippery slope starts to come. Like, oh, my goodness, this means that they're going to be an atheist and they're going to be, you know, dealing dealing meth on the street corner. In jail, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, from dealing meth. Right, right. <laughs> um, but, um, but anyhow, in reality, like, so are we surprised that a 14 year old or a 15 year old or a 17 year old has questions about the faith? Are we surprised that a 35 year old or a 45 year old or a 55 year old has questions about the faith? We're flawed human beings. And so I think that because a lot of Christian parents minister or, or, or parent from a position of fear, um, that we just kind of tamp that kind of stuff down. We don't want to open up that, what we perceive to be a Pandora's box. So two things practically, I would say, number one, we need to explicitly and reasonably um, say to kids like, Hey, if you have questions, like we need to talk about that, you know, play the devil's advocate, you know, what are the questions for in your mind? There's a good chance that I, I have had those questions or I struggle, struggle with those questions too. I just, you know, this the reality of who we see human beings to be in Scripture suggests that we're obviously, compared to an omniscient God, going to have, not going to have all the answers, you know? And so I think you want to encourage that. A second thing you want to do is, um, and that's not just, a lot of that is not just what you say, it's also what you do. You know, like when people have, um, when people express questions, kids express questions, or you hear people in the culture express questions, um, I think it's really important to say, you know, hey, that's a valid question. I can understand why a person would have that question. Um, you know, I mean, just this one example, if you're not a Christian, like homosexual, like why would you oppose homosexuality? Why would you oppose gay marriage if you're not a believer? You know, like that's a, it makes sense that if, if you, you know, if, if you buy into the ethos and the morality of this world, it's kind of, it's kind of logical. Yeah. If you think that this life is it, it's kind of logical that, you know, to follow your desires and pursue pleasure, whatever that is, according to you, kind of makes sense. We shouldn't be, shouldn't be surprised. And so we need to be careful not to just degrade and diminish opposing views, but say like, I can see how a person would think that just, you know, so, cause you're modeling to your child, like, Hey, if you have that question too, let's talk, you know, you, you're safe to come to me. Another thing too is, uh, Kara, Kara Powell and, um, for Youth Institute, she's talked about how um, doing kind of like preemptive, um, preemptive apologetics in a sense where, um, you know, like the way I do this is we watch the Reason for God videos, Tim Keller did, and we watched that with kids when they're seniors, and it's Tim Keller sitting That's there great. five non non. I know it well. It's it's an incredible series. It's great, and you know, it's it's people from a various non Christian worldviews. Uh, talking about the, the, you know, six biggest objections to the Christian faith. And so something that we'll do is we'll, I'll play the devil's advocate and um, I'll be Andy, the atheist. <laughs> and I'll ask the kids, I'll, I'll like, you know, start out and I'll ask our kids like, well, why do you believe this? Why do you believe this? Why do you believe that? And, da, 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 and just kind of push them on things and, and help them to, you know, kind of decon deconstruct if we can use that word. But kind of like, you know, prepare them for what that kid who was in debate in high school um, and he read all the like very pseudo intellectual, but seemingly convincing neo atheism. Um, uh, you know, what, what that kid who's going to be in the dorm with this, this, this young person next year in college is going to say to them, what the philosophy professor, if they go to college, is going to say to them, or, you know, what they're going to read, see on the internet on YouTube. It's unbelievable how many. YouTubers there are who are dedicated to trying to deconstruct Christianity. They sound so convincing. Um, in reality, if you have a person like the three of us who has a theological education, these people are actually 
really, really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I shouldn't say they're dumb, but they're they're you know philosophically not really very strong. They took one they, one they semester of psychology. Busy. What's that? They took one semester of psychology, and now they yeah. they're the expert. Well, all right, so. Go ahead. So, yeah, well, so that was the first, that was kind of the first, and like, how do we nurture doubt? And what the was sports. The part of that question? Sports. Yeah, a lot of, oh, yeah. you know, oh, my a, a number of people who left the church in this time frame, we, they said, well, we just kind of stopped going to church. My parents decided to prioritize our sports. And so, you know, I just never went back. Yeah. Okay. So, and, you know, if there are parents listening to this, like, you need to hear this. And uh, I'm going to come off the top rope. Uh, WWE style here. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is something that Colin Hansen and I are both, Colin, who's, you know, with the Gospel Coalition, that he and I, he and I are both just like hammering right now. And it's uh, it's something that I just wrote an article about it called Just Go to Church. I saw it. It was great. Coalition site. But basically, you know, you, there's there's a study that, that, that's been done over the last 10 years uh, by Christian Smith, who really is the, the leading expert on TV teenage spirituality of this century. He read, did a study in 2000, 2010 on uh, the, the national study on youth and religion. And now he's done another one looking at the spiritual impact of parents on their kids. And the book is called Handing Down the Faith. It's a tough read, kind of mm-hmm. academic, but it's worth looking at. But parents, what you see is um, that a kid is not going to exceed your religious commitment. It's like, you know, Colin said this, um, and, you know, at a, at a fundraiser a couple of weeks ago. He, he said, told you know, me, I know, I, I, I know where you're going and I'm excited to hear you say it. Yeah. It's like, Hey, so if, if you really want your church to attend your child to attend church every week, but growing up, they y'all, you as a family went to church once a month, your child's not going to exceed that. Yeah. It's not that they're leaving the church. It's that when they were a teenager, they weren't in the church. It was like, you know, it was like travel sports, uh, travel sports actually de-churched them and you participated in that. Not to throw, I mean, not to make anybody feel guilty or whatnot, but, but there's just a reality. Like you, you know, uh, that this study says that basically parents and what they model have the, by far the biggest impact on a kid's spiritual life. And, um, you know, the, the two biggest factors in prolificating that or, or, or promoting that child's lifelong faith is, having spiritual conversations at a just very basic level, just bringing life back to Jesus and going to church. And so, um, uh, and then, then the other, the, uh, and the other big factor was, you know, the parents, parents who were, who were, you know, healthy, loving, but also this, you know, discipline, disciplinarians, uh, that balance, they found that basically the, the, the you know, the, it wasn't just like, go to church and talk about Jesus. It was also like, what was the posture and the tone of your parenting? They found that parents who are overly permissive, who have no discipline, although they're connected to their kids and parents who are authoritative, they um, or sorry, like authoritarian, the, who were very, very strict and controlling, but didn't really weren't very kind, were very humble. Those parents, their kids really didn't want much to do with those parents faith. Whereas, um, Parents who did did discipline kids, they they were the adult, but they also loved their kids and were kind and humble and emotionally connected. That kids, by and large, very much wanted to embrace their parents' faith. So a lot of it has to do with character, character um, that that parents demonstrated. Yeah, well, in filling in both of those kind of those two factors that you just mentioned, one of the things I always I remember when I was in college, I was sitting in a, a philosophy of religion class. And uh, the professor asked a question, basically, uh, raise your hand if you grew up in a Christian church. And um, this is a, a university in the Deep South. So pretty much everyone in there had some sort of religious upbringing. And then he asked, raise your hand if you felt comfortable asking questions. And no one raised their hand. And so over the course of the next semester, this professor was easily able to dismantle faith after faith because this was the first time someone was intellectually engaging with many of these students uh, on their faith. They were like, well, thank you. Where I grew up, no one would actually talk to me about these things. And I actually don't think this professor meant to be antagonistic as much as he was just trying to raise questions. And so one thing, 
one thing I'm always talking to my students about in our youth ministry is one, like Cameron said, just affirming, hey, actually asking questions is an act of faith in and of itself. Because mm. it's saying we believe God is a God of truth. We believe that he has revealed these things to us. We should not be scared of seeking out answers to questions. But it's also treating them as serious individuals, yeah. treating them as people who have intellectual ability of their own to think through these things and who have faith of their own. And I think, like you said, Cameron, a lot of times when we're trying to just insulate them away from questions, insulate them away from objections from the world, what we're really doing is saying one day you're going to get out there and you're just going to get hammered by the world. Yeah. But the reality is the world, from the time that they're 12 on, YouTube is not treating them as children. TikTok's not treating them as children. Social media, social media school's not treating them as children. All you got to do is look at what's written on the bathroom wall and see that it's not treating them as children, right? These kids are being confronted with real adult conversations, younger and younger every year. And yeah. so as a church, I feel like that's where we have to be able to step into that gap and say, we're not going to treat you as children either. We're going to actually engage here. But Cameron, second, I kind of want to give you an opportunity to share a little bit of Rooted's history and Rooted's story, because without actually calling it as such, I, I know Rooted's story very well from having been involved in the ministry. But I feel like without y'all calling it as such, a lot of what we're talking about this season is what Rooted began to talk about and engage uh, a decade ago. Yeah. talking about de-churching and why people are leaving the church. So could you give us a little bit of a brief history of Rooted and what it was that y'all were seeking to address during that time? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for asking. Yeah, so Rooted is, um, it's a ministry that uh, empowers and equips parents and youth and family pastors to disciple kids towards lifelong faith, like our um, lifelong faith in Christ. <laughs> Um, everyone's going to have lifelong faith in something. It might be themselves, <laughs> yeah, but no, in Christ. And then, you know, our vision is that every child would receive grace-filled, gospel-centered, Bible-saturated discipleship at church and at home. So, uh, you know, for me, the norm kind of growing up was generally like you go down, you play a lot of games, uh, you, you know, get a lesson about not having premarital sex and not drinking. And then you play light the fire to emotionally motivate everybody to be good for a week and not make any bad decisions. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, what, we're, what we want the normal experience for a kid in church to be is that they would say that they um, heard about the grace of Jesus through the cross every week. They were taught the Bible in a substantive way every week. And it wasn't just their youth ministry, but it was their parents, their church and youth ministry as a whole that ministered to them in that way. And so and the issue that we're kind of, uh, addressing or kind of came onto the scene in response to is, you know, and, and around the turn of the century uh, that there was a switch, golly dog, that's like 22 years ago. Holy cow. <laughs> we're getting old. We're I know, man. We were like halfway through college, Jimmy Massimino. Um, <laughs> no, but um, it basically they, were, they looked at the efficacy of churches and forming kids who had lasting faith and they were finding that, you know, kids were not kids were not, most kids were not sticking with Christ in the church. Uh, you know, 70% of kids were leaving the church. And so churches were, were terribly ineffective at, uh, at forming kids with, you know, lasting faith. So then the second round of research looked at why, why is it that kids are not sticking? And, um, and they kind of found three factors with one being the dominant factor. One was kids were not being integrated into the church. Uh, they were in, you know, nursery, children's chapel, youth worship, youth group, so they weren't learning how to be, you know, servants and worshipers in, in the church. And um, so when they went out to the real world, there was a social barrier for them being a part of the church. Second was uh, uh, participation of parents. Churches were doing a terrible job at equipping and educating parents on how to spiritually invest with their kids. So church, kids, parents were kind of outsourcing their kids, um, their kids, spiritual lives to the church, like you would outsource, you know, piano to the music teacher, or, you know, athletics to the little league. And then finally, the biggest factor was theology and you know, what kids, um, what kids believed uh, was pretty much antithetical to basic biblical Christianity the term they used. And you know, probably, you'll probably use it every other episode, but moralistic therapeutic deism kids understood Christianity as a set of rules. Um, Therapeutic, they thought the point of Christianity was to be happy and to bolster their self-esteem. And DS take their view of the character of God is that he was distant, not involved in their life. Uh, if you had an emergency, he would come. But otherwise, uh, you know, you live independent lives. And so 
Yeah, the thing is that um, so much of the model for youth ministry has been um, just entertainment and um, emotions and, and rules. There wasn't, wasn't wasn't like biblical gospel centered discipleship. And so with Rooted, what we we're trying to to do is um, is to promote uh, to promote that you know grace filled gospel centered Bible saturated discipleship because you know the what, what you find is that well I mean to give you a sense of how what, what you find is that kids knowing the basic gospel of grace is probably the single biggest indicator of whether they'll, whether they'll stick with Christ or not. If a kid under, doesn't understand the gospel and thinks of Christianity in terms of rules, they're not going to stick with, with, um, with, with Jesus. Um, it, you know, it, they, but if they do understand Christianity as, um, Christianity as in terms of Jesus died for my sins, God loves me unconditionally through that. And my life is lived in response. My obedience is in response to God first loving me. That child actually has a pretty high likelihood of being a church tending Christian. So with that being said, with Rudy, what we were trying to do is um, is, is promote uh, graceful gospel-centered youth ministry and um, with a lot of biblical depth and richness. And so that's where the five pillars came from that you know we talk about quite a bit. Yeah, and so these five pillars that y'all talk about are gospel centrality, theological depth, relational discipleship partnerships with parents and intergenerational integration. Mm -hmm. And just reading those, you know, as a minister, you would think, okay, some of these jump out as, as obvious. Okay. Yes. Being involved relationally in the life of students makes sense for why that would shepherd them into lifelong faith mm -hmm. or faith they're teaching with uh, gospel centrality. But there's also some that I think for many people who are involved with student ministry or even parents and saying, how can we integrate our children to the life of the church would jump out as less obvious, like intergenerational integration. Right. And so one of the main factors that in the research that we've been able to look at and see is that there's been this generational handoff that's been completely missed. Mm -hmm. Right. Where, where generations are missing the ability to pass on lifelong fakes, either that's from parents to children or even from just uh, societally passing on faith from generation to generation. So why is it that you guys look at some of these pillars and maybe even specifically intergenerational integration and see that as so crucial to countering the movement of students outside of the church? I mean, to some ministers, I think that actually would be counterintuitive to bring other generations into your youth ministry. Yeah, totally. Um, and more than that, probably putting kids into the broader ministry of the church. So, so would you like me to focus more on the intergenerational piece or maybe just even go through all of them a little bit? Uh, yeah, just go, you can walk through, all, go through all of them. If that's all right. Yeah. I mean, gospel centrality, I, I've already alluded to that, but um, it's interesting in 2014 in a Christianity today or um, article, uh, Kara Powell, who's, you know, Christian Smith, and Kara Powell are probably two, the two most significant figures, two of the most significant figures in this study of kids sticking with Christ and the church. Um, she was asked, you know, what would you say is the most important indicator? And um, she said, you know, if a kid knows the Christianity in terms of the gospel of grace, it's the most important indicator of a kid sticking. And so here's the deal, though. Um, in that study, the National Study on Youth and Religion, yeah, they, they interviewed kids. They spent 350 hours asking kids, sorry, they asked 350 kids, talk about your religious beliefs for 30 minutes. And so that's 175 hours of interviews. Not a single kid mentioned the word gospel. Mm -hmm. in that uh, 175 hours the word grace in terms of god's unmerited love for sinners was used three times and so the reason i bring that up is because we a lot of times presume that kids know that and uh, you cannot presume that and honestly we forget it every day but you know they, they in, in one of another study they asked kids you know to find the gospel 35 percent of kids didn't even mention jesus wow um almost half the kids um, define the gospel as being a good person for God. Mm. So, you know, I, I, that, that, uh, that caught my attention uh, a long time ago. So we have something called the gospel catechism that we do in our church. We do it every week with uh, every Bible study with every children's Sunday school class. I do it with my kids every day when I drop them off at school. What does gospel mean? Good news. What's the good news? Jesus died for my sins. Why did he die for your sins? So I can have a relationship with him. He loves you the most, God. He loves you second most, mommy and daddy. What can you do about God's power and grace? Hard things. 
and and just you know so that that's that's what my kids hear every day when they get out of the car and uh, go to school we have another one called the gospel identity catechism that we do with teenagers that is uh who does the holy spirit say you are one who's washed and clean clean who does jesus say you are one who's forgiven and righteous who's god the father say you are and adopt the child of god who are you i'm a sinner saved by grace just is just reinforcing the identity my identity is is in christ my identity is defined by what jesus has done and what he's conferred to me by grace through faith man i think you have just uh made some modifications to the davis family trip to school in the morning yeah thank you oh yeah man but this is this is like a thing this is part of what we um part of what we do in our church family um it's catechizing kids in the gospel and so my, the, the thing i say you know people say well you know great the great thing is obvious well actually isn't I mean is it that obvious like you know Pat Lencioni who's a a guru on culture and leadership and corporations says talks about over communication and like the gospel needs to be over communicated um and modeled but you know and then theological depth like uh I'm a big I'm a I mean I'm a believer in the catechism you know I mean it doesn't have to be super sophisticated and fancy you don't have to memorize the Westminster larger catechism or anything like that, but like the gospel, the, the, the new city catechism that the gospel coalition published, I mean, that, that is a valuable tool and you can just listen to the music in your car, but you know, like between the catechism, but also just teaching through books of the Bible, like your kid can get all the theology they're going to need. And, um, and so that's why we were with rooted. We're such big fans of inductive Bible study because it get inductive Bible study, teaching through whole books of the Bible, it does so much to give kids a theological base. And, um, and that's why I think Rudy, we have like 15 books of the Bible of like inductive Bible study from beginning to end. Um, and then, you know, uh, relational discipleship, that's pretty obvious. Um, but I will say for people who are reformed leaning, a lot of times we're so big on like the head knowledge. We forget, like you got, you got to mentor kids. You got to disciple them and, and walk them in a relationship. Head knowledge doesn't ain't enough. You know, it has to be, there has to be, relationship intergenerational and, and, I would, and, I, and, and explain how that theology answers the questions the real questions they have in the world going back to whether right. it's doubt if, or if you're not involved in their lives they're not going to believe that you care about their lives they're not going to believe that this gospel is applicable to their lives as they say scholar they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care <laughs> <laughs> hey, some, of those, some of those adages are right spot on huh <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now you just teed me up for a good old cheesy, uh, cheesy um, mantra or slogan, but it actually is true. <laughs> Intergenerational integration. Let's let's set up shop here for a second because um, this is a big one. And in terms of like practical, concrete things that you can do that make a huge difference, um, you know, intergenerational integration is one of those. And so what we mean by that is like, the thinking for a long time had been like, well, kids don't really understand the sermon and they're kind of a distraction. So let's get, let's not have them in the worship service, you know, let's until like they're in middle school or high school. Uh, they don't want to be there. Let's just move them out. Well, actually what you find is number one is that the earlier you get kids in church, the higher likelihood is that they're going to be a church tending Christian. There's a, there's a direct correlation between those two. And, and like, so much of what's going on is not, and you kind of, in parenting, it's, uh, you know, modeling. The values are more caught than they are taught. And so, you know, to be in a church service where they see um, you singing, they see you, you know, participate in liturgy, they see you, you know, listen to the sermon, taking notes, whatever, that they learn a ton from that. Um, and so getting kids in worship services uh, early is, is really good. They don't have to be there the whole time. You know, you don't, there's no need to have a three-year-old in there for an hour and a half long service, but you know, at least in increments early on is really good. And then, um, and then two, this is, this is big. Got to hear this one is you want to treat kids like adults. And so this is, this is the mindset that we have. And this is what I encourage. And that is by the time a kid is say in the 10th grade, you want them to be functioning like a contributing adult in your church. So you want to be, you know, as a, when you're doing children's ministry, you're doing youth ministry, you want to be thinking like, okay, when this kid's 15 or 16, I want them to be able to lead a middle school Bible study. I want them to be a 
um, a reliable, faithful children's Sunday school teacher. I want them to be able to play in our, our you know, uh, in, in our youth, in our, sorry, our, our congregation's worship band, if that's something you have. Um, or, you know, if you're in a liturgical setting like me, we have acolytes. Um, quite honestly, that's a, that's a real, I know you guys are a little bit low church, huh. but um, for high church folks, um, you know, having kids participate in the worship service, like reading scripture, uh, singing in the choir, you know, playing an instrument in the band, playing an instrument, you know, uh, whatever it may be, um, is a man. It's a you, you play. You can play some serious winning football with that. Hmm. It, it's, a, it's remarkable the studies on when kids are have a role in the church where it's meaningful, and they're treated like an adult. They're counted on for something, you know, substantive. The likelihood there will be a church tending Christian is very high. Uh, particularly uh, teaching children Sunday school. And um, yeah, they really, even if there's one study that says, even if they're doing it to get out of the worship service, <laughs> those kids are super, super highly likely to be a church tending Christian. When I read that study, dude, we started pumping kids <laughs> into children's ministry. We have 15 or 16 kids who help out with children's ministry. And quite honestly, a lot of them are our best children's ministry teachers and volunteers. Dude, now you're changing the we things we do in our church. <laughs> I have a couple, we have a couple of kids, a couple of like high school kids in our church where the, the parents like kind of just like take a back seat and they just take, they take the cues and orders from the, the high school kid. Right. But it makes sense because when you're teaching children Sunday school, I found this a challenge whenever I was teaching children Sunday school sometimes is you're having to articulate the gospel in its most basic and simple terms, right? You're learning week after week to communicate gospel in its most simple terms to children. So these students are just being, again, again, catechized, but they're t by teaching. And so, uh, which is a call for each one of us in our churches to analyze. We say we want students involved in our church. You know, people are always like, we want more youth in the church or whatever, but how open is your church to students? And that's the real question. Like you said, could they read scripture? Could they be in the children's ministry? Could they, you know, set up coffee or do parking, whatever it may be, is how open is our churches really to students? And it's really a call to kind of do a yeah. whole, you know, anal analysis of our church and see where our students mm -hmm. even welcome here. Yeah. And, and there's also too, you know, uh, we're talking a lot about from a church leadership standpoint about this kind of stuff, but if you're a lay person, um, it's, it's remarkable how powerful it is that you know the names of kids, that you encourage them, that you're kind to them. Um, it's uh, there's a, there was another study that looked at how, I need to be able to be like, it was this study, this time, this publication. I just read them all over the last, like, you know, 15 years and I had four kids and it, you know, it happens. <laughs> Life is busy. And, and, yeah. And, and, uh, and Jimmy Massimino and I did, uh, did the RTS, you know, death march together. <laughs> so, anyhow, but there was another study that basically found out they, you know, there's a correlation between a kid, you ask a kid, you know, how many people in your church like knew you and had an interest in your spiritual life other than your parents who were outside your generation. And there's, you know, correlation between the more, the you know higher likelihood they'd be a church tender. So yeah, just being a, just learning the names of kids, mm -hmm. encouraging them, you know, um, uh, especially if they're doing, so, you know, they read scripture, oh, you did a good job or playing the band. Oh yeah, it's so great that you do that. And how, how the mission trip to, you know, to, to the Delta go, whatever, whatever it is you're doing. And so, yeah, the, 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 any, everyone in the church can really play a vital role just by being friendly and getting to know kids. Cause you want, cause with that being said, you're building a paradigm for what church is for a kid. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I will say for my children, like their, their experiences, there are all these people who love me. There are all these people who know me. There are all these people who celebrate me. Like they, they, have, they love church. Right. And, um, and, you know, they like to help out with the, I mean, my kids are young, but they help out with making the the stuff for VBS, you know, like the decorations and whatnot. And they just, they just really like it. They're, they're excited about being an acolyte or, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and so that's the, that's what church is to them. So when they leave, they're gonna say, Hey, church is a place where I'm loved. Church is a mm -hmm. place where I have a, 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 I have a place, I have a part. It goes a long way. Well, and I, I love how you uh, talk about little ones in worship. And, you know, in our context, we're not 
necessarily dogmatic about it. There are options based on different family yeah. situations, but it always has amazed me how much my kids pick up. You know, when they're little, they're, we sing a new song in church they've never heard on the radio or at home, and that evening they're, they're just playing with blocks and singing that song. One uh, one service before I got up to preach, my, my daughter was probably in second or third grade, and I lean over and I said, hey, Ivy, uh, I'm not feeling too well. Um, I might need you to go up and preach a sermon for me, just messing with her. And she said, I got it, Daddy. <laughs> and I, I was like, well, what, what would you say? She said, you're all sinners and you need God. <laughs> Whoa! I was like, I was like that's go. second grade. That, that's better than 80% of the sermons preached on a Sunday probably. <laughs> but, you know, then I, I go up to my um, 14, about to be 15-year-old, and you know, I can feel, and, and I feel like I'm somewhat engaged with seminary students, college students. I'm somewhat engaged in culture. And I feel like, I mean, weekly, he's asking me about a social media platform I didn't even know existed. Yeah. He's using words I've never heard yeah. before. I mean, I, again, I feel like I'm somewhat connected to culture and it feels like culture is moving faster than me. And, and I think for the average parent of a teenager, we, you know, we feel just like, how do I catch up? I don't even know what my kids are being exposed to. So how can I, how can I prepare them for some part of the culture? I don't even know exists. So, I mean, the rate of change is happening uh, amazingly fast. So what are, how can parents and ministers feel confident that they're reaching students or kids, grandkids, where they are at and ministering them in, in a way that actually engages them uh, without trading in their commitment to the pillars that you're talking about? That's a, that's a really good question, Jim. And I think it's something that um, a lot of, parents or even like youth pastors, it's an insecurity or a fear that they struggle with. And I just want to first, first, like right out of the gates, let everybody listening to this know, I have done youth ministry really for about 20 years, uh, professionally for 18. I am not cool <laughs> at all. I'm not cool at all. And I'm really not that much fun. I don't know any games, hardly know any games. And, um, and like, when I say like, I'm not cool, I couldn't tell you any of like the pop artists who are big right now. I don't, I don't, I just don't know any of that. And I hate to say this. I'm a huge Alabama football fan. I couldn't tell you five major league baseball players. I don't know if I could tell you 10 NBA players. Um, I don't even know what hockey is to be honest with you. I don't know if I can name 12 <laughs> hockey teams. I just don't, I'm not that up to date on movies. I've never in my entire life seen one of the Marvel movies. Not wow. a one. Not wow. A one. Yeah, not a one. I'm just not into it. Not my thing. And um, and so, and yet, I've, you know, I've been able to like uh, effectively do youth ministry uh, for a long time. And so, um, so with that being said, like kids are way more interested in a person who is, um, who is, you know, comfortable in their own skin, not trying, not trying too hard to be impressive or cool. And someone who listens to them and who asks them engaging questions about their life um, and pursues them. And who just genuinely cares. That trumps being cool, being relevant every day. On top of that, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, comes to all of the, the questions that kids ask and the change in culture and those kind of things. You know, one thing we can take comfort in is that the truth of God's word is timeless. Um, it's timeless. And so like, I think a trap we can fall into is feeling like, okay, we have tactically got to anticipate every question that a kid's going to have and give them the answer to that specific question. When I think we're a lot better off um, teaching kids like the some, some basic biblical con conceptual frameworks, mm -hmm. um, like creation, fall, redemption, glorification, you know, that you can run pretty much any question that a child asks through creation, fall, redemption, glorification. And like, you know, whether it's questions about sexuality or gender identity or, um, you know, the evil in the world or whatever, I mean, you can explain all those in terms of, you know, the creation of the world, the fall because of sin, God's work in the world through his grace, through, you know, through the work of Jesus Christ, 
and the work of the Holy Spirit, and then, you know, the hope we have of, of heaven. Um, or, you know, things like the now and the not yet. <laughs> uh, you know, the, 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 the overlapping of the age to come and, and of the present evil age, like the now and the not yet, that, that, that's going to help you answer a lot of questions, particularly when it comes to suffering and evil in the world. Um, and, you know, how is that, how is that possible under, uh, given, you know, what Jesus has done and, and the goodness of God? Yeah, and then, sorry, get ready to vomit. I'm going to talk about Nick Saban. Get a, get a barf bag. He was <laughs> once asked, you know, why do you, why do you still do a pro-style offense? And he said, because the pro-style offense has every, has, it can, has an answer for every defense. Pro-style offense is a concept-based offense. Um, whereas a lot of other ones are more like, hey, we got our play and this is what we're going to run. And it doesn't have the ability to kind of, uh, doesn't have the ability to check out of the play. The defense isn't favorable. And so pro style offense is conceptual. The things that are conceptual take longer to learn, um, take a lot more reinforcement. But once you learn them, that concept, any defense that a, you know is thrown at you on the field, the pro style offense has an answer to you. And so that's the same thing with good biblical conceptual framework. And so, um, so anyhow, um, so I, I would just, I think we don't need to, I think having a few of those go-tos like creation, fall, redemption, glorification, um, the now and the not yet, some things like that, that we just, that we hammer and bring everything back to, um, actually, you know, serve to prepare a kid because, Hey, shoot, who knows what's going to, life's going to look like in 10 years. Holy cow. Think about life, t- you know, back in 2010. Hardly anybody had a mm-hmm. smartphone. There was no Instagram. Um, there's no Snapchat. There's no TikTok. How did we uh, make you it? You know, boys were boys and girls were girls um, for the most part. And um, and now, you know, life has just changed so fast. It's going to change even faster. So, but yeah, God, God, who he is, the narrative we live under through Christ, the, you know, the narrative that we see of life in scripture, like timeless. And it's the pro style offense, you know, it's got the answer for any defense. And, you know, I, I, I'm thinking as you're talking, all the things are changing at a rapid pace. We're not the first generation to experience this. My great-grandmother, when she was born, the mode of transportation was horse and wagon, and she saw a man on the moon. So, like, we're not the first generation to experience massive oh, yeah. technological and right. cultural change. And I just so appreciate the humility in your answer, you know, being able to use an Alabama illustration when you had so many losses last season. So... Thanks for I know, me. man. You know, my daughter coming into this season, she turned 10 today. She had seen 11 losses in her entire life. Is that not insane? I think, I think that uh, almost four national titles in 10 years. In the first two seasons of my life. What's that? All right. All right. Listen, I, I can't, I can't not, I'm Florida State when, and we're going to go to our last question in just a second. But when I was, I think I was 22 when uh, Miami came in and beat us at home. And it was the first time we lost at home since I was 11 years old. Oh, my stars. That's amazing. Well, that's what yeah, makes it. Yeah, and it was like the first how many years were they undefeated in the ACC? Oh, it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. From, from 88 to 2002, worst ranking, fourth in the nation. All right. We digress. I've got to. I don't know. I think we, it gives us a little. They can hear what we talk about offline. All right. Cameron, as we land the plane here, um, you know, if someone wants to go further, they want to see more resources, whether it's from Rooted or elsewhere, what what kinds of resources would you recommend to parents, youth pastors, church leaders on this topic? Yeah, I'll talk particularly about what Rooted has. Yeah, I mean, our blog is awesome. Um, it is. Out, Skyler writes on it. He does. He does. He, yeah, we put out three articles a week for youth pastors, uh, youth and family stuff, and then three articles a week for um, for parents. So, and we have an incredibly good resources tab. So a lot of these topics that you're, you know, that you're wondering about, go to the resources tab and look it up. You can probably find it, you know, three or four, maybe half dozen articles um, on just about anything you want. We also have some, uh, we have five different podcast channels. <laughs> And, um, uh, you know, w- one of which is uh, Rooted Parent. That's the one I'm on with Anna Harris, Team Mom. And that, that's just talking about scripture, the gospel, and parenting. Um, you know, Rooted Youth Ministry, we have Rooted Conference, which has old conference content. So good. So, so good. So, um, so you know, Ask Alice has to do with uh, teen mental health. And, um, 
Anastathaeus has to do with, you know, youth culture and they're really into comic books, the, the Marvel stuff. I, they don't know any of it. So I didn't know what Thanos, I didn't know what Thanos was when they made it. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I really recommend that. We, I really it came out with something really cool. I recommend for churches called, it's called Rooted Reservoir Family Discipleship. And it's a, um, basically it, it has uh, eight courses they're video courses from authoritative voices with inductive Bible study, but it's stuff on like how to talk to kids about sex, how to integrate Christian practice into your, um, into your family. Oh goodness. Stuff about technology. It's, it's just the uh, law and gospel and parenting, shame and grace and parenting, uh, the dynamics of um, the gospel and uh, an immigrant family. So um, it's uh it's, it's a, uh, if a church subscribes to it, everyone, anyone in the church can access it. So that's it's a gem. It's only two hundred fifty dollars for a year. It's a kind of steal. Yeah, Rooted Reservoir has tons of resources. We use them. He was Cameron mentioned the inductive Bible studies and how important that is to Rooted. The Rooted Reservoir. If you're a youth minister, if you're a parent, if you're a small group and you're looking for small group material and everything, we use it for every series we do. If someone's speaking at our youth group, if they're leading a Bible study, we always make sure and send them the rooted reservoir material. It's very well written. It's contextualized and it's asking real life questions to the students. So that's a, that's a high recommend for me on the rooted reservoir material for the Bible studies. And also like Cameron mentioned for the parenting resources. Yeah, I use it. I use rooted reservoir for youth ministry too. I mean, uh, it's got all these video courses to train like new volunteers and uh, new youth pastors and Bible study teachers it has courses for how to teach the Bible to teenagers, courses on gospel and youth ministry, courses for elders on how to make a good hire and how to, mm. how, you know, search committees, that kind of stuff. It's, it's money. It's really good. And then the Bible study is so good. It's all inductive begins, begins with the gospel catechism ends with a gospel nugget. It's, it's money. Well, Cameron, I really appreciate you joining us today. Any excuse Dude, to hang out? Thanks with, for having me. Well, any excuse to hang out with y'all, we'll, we'll we'll figure it out. It's we're really thankful for the work you're doing, I, and I, I'm dead serious when I say there are things about my own family and church that I'm already thinking about uh, modifying from this this time with us today. So, man, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Cameron. Thanks for having me, guys. Howdy, toddy. Well, join us next week. Uh, next episode is going, we're going to take this one step further and, and we're, we've been in sixth to 12th grade. We're going to be talking college ministry and uh, and how college ministry, we have some amazing statistics and the research and how crucial college the college years are, some very hopeful things we found. So we will be back next with that episode. Blessings. <laughs>